name is Georgia Panopoulos. I'm a pain psychologist. Just left the University of Minnesota after 16 years and joined uh, Health Partners Pain Clinic. Um, but I met Ken Bauman, a physical therapist at the University of Minnesota when I was working there. And we hope to talk a little bit about acute and chronic pain management. Our session today was based on a research that was developed and funded by Nord Nordis. We're going to talk more about pain specifically. And with regard to the HERO study, pain is only one of the variables that was looked at. They also looked at function, bleeding incidents, depression, anxiety, self-esteem. We'll touch upon a few of those as they relate to um, pain management. As you already know, individuals with bleeding disorders do have a lot of pain. Pain can sometimes be a result of a ble bleeding incident. Chronic pain can also develop, however, secondary to multiple bleeds in a particular joint. Our goals are to raise awareness regarding the pain that individuals suffer who have bleeding disorders. Improve understanding of how pain affects patients. In many cases, pain isn't just limited to the physical sensation. It impacts our sleep, it impacts our emotional well-being, it impacts our ability to function inside and outside the home. We wanna take that all into consideration when we're talking to our providers about getting some help for managing this pain. We want to establish a framework for management of acute and chronic pain. We'll talk a little bit about what the difference is between acute and chronic. And hopefully, we'll have some resources that you can take home with you and begin to have this conversation with your providers about the fact that you or your family members are hurting. Now, types of pain. Many of you may have heard about the different types of pain and how we classify pain. Acute pain is sudden. It's usually from a joint and muscle bleed or surgery. So we talk about post-operative pain. Acute pain is anything that lasts less than three to six months. And we usually expect pain in response to an injury, an illness, a surgery. It's an indication that the body is healing. When we start talking about chronic pain, chronic pain is a pain from joint damage, long-term ongoing. It's usually lasting greater than three to six months, and it has multiple contributing factors. Has anybody have pain even longer than the time that probably took the body or the joint to heal. Sure. We uh, sometimes individuals experience chronic pain even in the absence of any pathology or injury in a joint, in a muscle tissue, in the spine. And at that point, we start to wonder what else is going on in the body that's contributing to that pain. Sometimes it's muscle tension, sometimes it's nerves. Uh, firing, sometimes it's lack of sleep. And then with this population, obviously, as you know, there's acute on chronic. So we have chronic pain, perhaps in a joint, in a muscle, and then lo and behold, there's another bleed or another injury, another acute episode that adds um, to the uh, uh, pain picture. I'm gonna hand off to Kim. She's gonna talk a little bit more about the specific findings from HERO as they pertain to pain with this population. My name is Kim Baum, and I'm a physical therapist at the Center for Bleeding and Clotting Disorders at the um, University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. And I've been working with patients with hemophilia for, let me think, 16 years now. I'm gonna just uh, discuss what the findings were from the HERO study that kind of collaborate what we all know, that there is pain in hemophilia. There's significant pain in hemophilia. There's different types of pain in hemophilia, all right? So initially, as far as bleeding findings, about three out of four adults were reporting spontaneous bleeds in the HERO study. I put spontaneous in bold for a reason. I'm gonna to touch back on that later in the presentation. <coughs> so remember that term. And about two out of four children were reporting spontaneous bleeding. And what they found is that pain increased with the number of bleeds. None of this is a surprise to any of us. Those increased bleeding episodes, the people that were reporting bleeding as the amount of bleeding increased per year, you saw less mobility, less ability to perform activities of daily living, more disability and pain, more arthritis, and people were reporting more pain interference in the month previous to when they filled out this survey. So pain interfering with life, with work, with daily activities. Now looking at the pain findings, about three out of four people with hemophilia or bleeding disorders, will say not just hemophilia, live with pain or discomfort. Three out of four, we just heard that two slides back, three out of four were reporting spontaneous bleeds. Now we've got three out of four reporting pain or discomfort. Is that a coincidence? Probably not. This pain was rated as high as extreme and at least as high as moderate for seven out of the 10 people who filled out the survey. 
That's a lot of people experience moderate to extreme pain. 43% that were reporting pain reported it as chronic. Of the people that were reporting pain, 38% of them uh, attributed it to their hemophilia. So whether they aren't recognizing it, it as related to hemophilia or if it truly is from something else. Just because you have a bleeding disorder doesn't mean everything is related to the bleeding disorder, correct? So we hear about just because you have a hammer, everything shouldn't look like a nail. Okay, so keeping in mind that if there's an issue with the knee, our first assumption is that it's a knee bleed. That's not always the case. It could be a meniscal tear. It could be, um, you know, an old injury. Maybe there was a sport or an activity as a child and it's arthritis from that. So be careful too to make sure that it's not always tunnel vision and assuming bleeding um, is related at all times. As far as reporting other medical conditions, the most commonly reported medical condition in this group was bone or skeletal problems, probably arthritis. Again, this was in 49% of the people with bleeding disorders, not surprising. Additional findings related to pain. Um, if you recall, so back on those additional findings related to bleeding, increased bleeding episodes, we had less mobility, less ability to perform activities of daily life. Now we see again, people who are reporting more pain are also reporting less mobility, less ability to participate in it on daily activities, difficulty with uh, low physical quality of life. That's the, the physical experience of pain. And then also you have the mental quality of life, how they're experiencing that, the negative thoughts, the things that come in when you're in constant pain. Again, with the pain interference in the previous month, 92% responding that they had some sort of pain interference in the previous month and more arthritis. Of all the different emotional distress indicators, some common psychiatric conditions that we've all heard of, stress, depression, insomnia, fatigue, anxiety, one out of three people with bleeding disorders reported um, experiencing you know, some of these psychological or psychiatric conditions related to hemophilia. And then the impact of pain on sleep. This one is very important. Nine out of 10 people were reporting that their chronic pain was disturbing their sleep. So why is this important? Other than the fact that we feel terrible when we don't get enough sleep, right? We also know that when you have a sleep disturbance that interferes with your pain, impacts your pain. It impacts your disability. It impacts your symptoms and your experience of the symptoms. So let's say you don't get enough sleep. Now your pain is worse. Pain makes you not be able to sleep well, right? Now you didn't sleep well, now your pain symptoms are worse. So you get into this vicious cycle with lack of sleep and then your pain getting worse. Um, and it's hard to break that cycle. There were some findings of what kind of activities adults are involved in. This is related to the National Hemophilia Foundation Play It Safe. So there's safe, safe to moderate, moderate, kind of ranking activities from safe to, to high risk. What they found, the highest percentage was 32%, and that was people reporting that they were using regular walking for fitness or pleasure, okay? All of these activities that were reported in the HERO study fall within the safe to moderate. So adults are very much erring on the side of the safe to moderate, and the highest percentage was only 32% participating in something. So we have a lot of people that probably aren't participating in the activities that they want to, possibly related to pain. In contrast, looking at the activities of children, all the way up to 47%, we have more children reporting that they're active. And if you look at the activities, a lot of those safe to moderate again, but higher percentages of them, and even some moving into a little bit riskier. On the right side of the table, you see the aspirational activities of the kids. I find this really interesting, obviously. I'm not gonna advocate that they play football. A child with severe hemophilia, we're, not, we're just not gonna do that. But there are other aspirational activities out there, things that they want to do. Are there things that we can do to support them, to help with their pain, you know, bracing different things to get kids into these activities and participating in the aspirational activities that they're interested in? I have to say, I like that slide talks a lot about the, our children are very normal, they want to do normal activities, and how do we advocate for their continued involvement in many activities without getting hurt? Okay, so managing pain, as I indicated before, acute pain and chronic pain. We want to be able to manage both. However, the goals for one versus the other may be a little bit different. So managing acute pain, and remember that uh, acute pain is anything that's caused by an injury or a bleed or surgery. In terms of managing acute pain, we want to manage the physical aspects of pain to allow for rest and healing. And in this particular case, it wouldn't be uncommon, it wouldn't be uncalled for to use medications and a number of different classes of medications to help an individual feel comfortable enough so that their body can rest and heal. 
you probably have already noticed that we haven't talked a lot about pharmacological interventions. We do know that pharmacological interventions, medications, are an important part of pain management. Today, and this session focuses more on the behavioral and the physical therapy aspects of pain management, but pharmacological interventions do have a role. With regard to acute pain, not only do we want to use our medications as prescribed by our doctors, but what are some other things that we can do to help an individual heal from an acute bleed or an acute injury? Rest. rest. As long as we can provide an opportunity for them to rest, to get a good night's sleep, what other things can you think of that you may have learned from the physical therapist or from the nurses at the HTCs? Might need crutches. Or Might need crutches. Exactly. How can we mobilize perhaps that joint so we're not overusing it and creating that spontaneous bleed, in quotations, that uh, Kim had already talked about. With chronic pain, it becomes much more complicated because with chronic pain, it's already lasted beyond the amount of time that we would uh, uh, expect for healing. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we did anything wrong. It just means that the body sometimes takes a little bit longer and sometimes there are indications in the body that suggest that the, this pain is gonna continue and this might be something that we have to learn to live with. And I know a lot of my patients don't like to hear that term, but many of us have pain that's not gonna go away, but it would be nice to decrease that baseline level of pain to something more manageable and perhaps also decrease the frequency and intensity and duration of a pain flare, pain flare being a significant increase in our baseline. So once again, with chronic pain, multiple factors contributing, sleep being one of those, overuse, underuse, or deconditioning being some of those factors. Uh, muscle tension can be a, 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 a contributing factor. Increased arousal in the system because of stress or distress could be contributing factors. But our goal is to decrease the baseline level of pain once again, using medical, behavioral, and physical therapy interventions, but also decreasing the frequency, intensity, and duration of pain flares. And I don't know how many times patients come into my office, and we live in Minnesota, and it gets cold. And that cold weather can definitely contribute to a lot of arthritic pain, a lot of chronic pain conditions that people present with. And um, the other thing that contributes, obviously, is overdoing it, overexertion. So we do hear a lot of people say when they have chronic pain, you know, Georgia, I have good days and I have bad days. On those good days, I might overdo it and pay the consequences. So how do we pace? How do we moderate our activities? How do we listen to our body so we're not uh, experiencing more wear and tear and thus more pain over time? And then also limit the negative consequences of um, constant pain. Once we uh, develop chronic pain that feels impossible to manage, we're not sleeping as well, we're creating a lot of emotional distress. How do we manage those things? Even if we can't directly manage the pain, how do we manage those other things so our quality of life can improve? And I'm a firm believer, having worked at pain clinics now for 20 years, that individuals sometimes say, you know, my pain level really hasn't changed, but I'm sleeping so much better. I'm enjoying time with my kids and my grandkids. I'm able to do the things that I want and need to do. And that's really when we're talking about any chronic illness, not just chronic pain, that's really what we want, is we want to be able to live our lives. Measuring pain. A lot of times when our family members are in pain, we are racking our brain to try to figure out how bad is it, right? With the ones that are verbal, with the kiddos that are verbal, we can just ask them, you know, where does it hurt? How much does it hurt on a scale of one to 10? Or looking at these faces, can you tell me how you're feeling right now? The observational scales are the ones that we typically reserve for the little ones that may not have the capacity to uh, tell us in words. Um, and the observational scales, when you're thinking about your little ones, what are some of the things that you look for to identify whether or not their pain is under control? Any ideas? <clears throat> Facial grimacing with the real little ones, with the infants, how they're holding their body, how they're posturing, the inability to relax, the inconsolability of them. So you try everything as a parent, as a caregiver, and they're inconsolable. Those are some indications that there's physical pain. That, yes? I know that um, you would watch them and see when they start favoring a limb that that's Absolutely. where pain is. When they finally get to a place that they know that I'm just going to deal with it and they'll just go along and stop using the affected 
part exactly. of their body. Exactly, <coughs> exactly. I think you bring up a really good point too. We see this, and obviously Kim sees this in the clinic quite a bit, where the little kiddos may not want to say how much pain they're in because they want to continue engaging in the activity that they're engaging in. And so as parents and caregivers, we have to use our observational skills to say, you know what? You're engaging in that activity, but you're not using your left arm or your right leg or whatever the case may be. And so being able to mobilize them in such a way that they can still participate in some activity, but they're protecting that joint. Very good. When it comes to measuring pain, we try to ask much more than just how bad is your pain? What is the pain intensity? That's one of many questions. You know, as a healthcare provider, as healthcare providers that you go to, and even as family members and caregivers, you want to know where does it hurt? What words best describe the pain? And let them use whatever words make sense to them. Words can be very telling. There are certain group of words that indicate more nerve pain. There are certain grouping of words that may indicate more of a joint or a skeletal problem. There are certain words that are more descriptive, perhaps, of a muscle pain. Interestingly, there are also words that are more descriptive of physical pain and words that are descriptive of emotional pain. That does not mean that physical pain doesn't exist. What it means is now the physical pain has impacted our emotional well-being. And some of those words that I, I as a psychologist, kind of clue into are, I feel miserable. I feel overwhelmed, I'm fatigued. I mean, these are words that suggest that the pain is such that it's impacting other aspects of our life. Are you having other symptoms or side effects of medications? A lot of times the pain is one thing, but other symptoms, so nausea and vomiting along with the pain perhaps. That's not, that could be a side effect of medication or it could be a side effect of the pain that is under treated. There are also side effects of medications that we need a clue into. We have, we have a balancing act if we're taking medications for pain management. Is it managing the pain is one question. Is it creating other symptoms that are perhaps as intolerable? And so how do we, how do we balance that? Yes. Oh. You know, I've also heard um, maybe there, that emotional pain or when the physical has rushed into emotional, I'll hear like, I just feel bleh. Yes. There's not really a word, word. or I feel blah. Right. So, and, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to, like, I don't know what that means, but okay. I know exactly. You don't feel great. Yeah. Exactly. That might be a term that they're using. Right. In the pain clinic, we have this handout. It's a list of emotions, quite honestly. And they range from mad, glad, sad, and scared. And there's probably 80 different words. I wouldn't force this list on anybody to have to choose one, and those 80 words are just really just a sampling of what people can use. Blah, I like that. It indicates that I, I'm, I'm miserable. You know, this, is, this isn't okay, I don't feel okay. And then how much does pain interfere? Obviously, when our kids can't participate in the activities that they want to participate in with their family and their friends, obviously when we can't get up and go to work, if we can't get, get to the family functions, we're talking about pain that's significant enough that warrants some attention. Doc, um, you know, it seems like we're managing the hemophilia, we're managing the chronic illness, but you know, I've noticed that my child isn't going to school or my child isn't getting the grades that he or uh, she was getting. So it's interfered either directly or indirectly. And so how do we pay attention to what's going on with the illness and the uh, ramifications of that illness? So once again, we can improve quality of life. These are some signs of pain, not exclusive. There are many others that you probably noticed in your own family members and yourselves. Trouble with sleep, change in mood, and usually with the little ones, the change in mood that we typically see is grumpy, irritability. Yeah. So a lot of times with the little ones, we're not necessarily going to see depressed mood. We're not even going to hear them talk about depressed mood. That's a term that we use in the medical field. Um, they might talk about, I'm sad, they might talk about um, uh, that I, I feel that I can't do the things that my friends are doing, but um, irritability is something that you'll definitely sense. And as a parent, what's your response to irritability, usually? Well, you get mad, exactly. <laughs> so there you go, there's the other vicious cycle. They're expressing emotions, and our response to that emotion is more emotion. So we might see more irritability, lack of concentration. This is huge. Not only does pain impact our concentration, our attention at school and at work and with family members and being able to hold a conversation, but, um, but some of the other consequences of chronic pain can lead to that too or some of the medications. So once again, it's a balancing act. 
uh, less active, less social, talkative. You know, the less social and talkative, over time, that can impact so many more things. Their opportunities to make friends, their opportunities to enjoy pleasant activities. And if you have a life where, you know, it's one pain episodes after another, one doctor's visit after another, and there isn't that opportunity for enjoyable events to offset that, you know, the literature suggests it takes two positive events to override a negative event. So we have to really work hard to make sure that as we're managing a chronic illness and chronic pain, and perhaps the uh or the blah, the blah that goes along with it, that we're engaging in some pleasant activities that can override the effects of those negative uh, events. Everyone is different, things to consider. Everybody's pain experience is different. Uh, no two people, despite having the same MRI findings, despite having the same lab tests, despite having the same diagnosis, no two people's pain experience is the same, nor would we expect it to be. So we might have individuals in the pain clinic who have an awful looking elbow on an MRI, two people, and one person is maybe mobilizing, but doing what they need to do. The other person is having significant sleep disturbance and distress and a, a lot of dysfunction. What are some of the differences? Nobody is to blame. Everybody's experience is different. Uh, but there are some factors that influence family modeling. So how our family <coughs> members respond to pain may impact how we respond to pain. I'm 100% Greek. And for those of you who know Greeks or Italians or anybody from Mediterranean cultures or whatnot, we're very dramatic. And so when everybody, anybody's in pain, everybody knows about it. <laughs> we don't deal with it on our own. So family modeling can have a huge impact. Past experiences with pain, and this is huge with this patient population. If we had an experience with pain that was somewhat traumatic, and I don't use that term loosely, but it's negative, it's life-changing, it can't fully be explained why, why it went down like that. If we've had a past experience trying to manage pain and didn't go as it, it should have gone, then the next time what happens when there's a bleed or when there's an increase in pain, there might be a lot of anticipatory anxiety along with that painful episodes. So the, the a person with the bleeding disorder or with the injury might have more anxiety about, oh my gosh, here we go again. But also the family members might have more angst and anxiety and fear about, you know, where do we go from here? What do we do? Functional capacity. Individuals who are involved in a number of different things, pain becomes just one small piece of the pie, right? So if we have a pie and we have a number of different activities and functions and roles, that might override that pain experience that we have. If all we have to think about is our illness, if all we have is our doctor's appointments and managing this illness, then there's nothing to, um, to protect us. It's a protective variable. There's nothing to protect us, perhaps, when that pain or that illness is at its worst. So the more we're engaged in, the more protective barriers we have. Pain perceptions, and Kim talked about this a little bit. The way we perceive pain, uh, our thoughts related to pain, can have a tremendous impact. Um, and I don't want to say that it's easy, as easy as mind over mood because it's not that simple. But the way we perceive pain, so for instance, if our perception of pain is, oh my gosh, something is wrong, it's going to increase our autonomic nervous system reactivity, which also increases the pain messages that are processed in the brain. But if our response instead is, you know what, this is something that we're going to have to look into, let me talk, uh, uh, call the doctor's office. I have three little girls. And they know that I work, I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I work in the medical field. So when my three little girls have anything wrong with them, they'll immediately want to go to the doctor. They, they have a lot of anxiety, they probably get it from me. <laughs> they have a lot of anxiety about pain or illness or fevers or whatnot. All it takes is for me to call or to tell them that I'm calling one of my medical colleagues. I talked to Angie, she's a nurse practitioner I used to work with. I talked to Angie, I told her what she was, were experiencing, she told me that all you needed to do was rest. They don't take it from me, but they'll take it from Angie, who's a nurse practitioner. Sometimes that's sufficient to ease their worry. They need some reassurance. Having said that, I don't want to reassure them 
uh, uh, when it's something that does need medical attention. So we have to use those reassuring words very judiciously for ourselves too, not just for our family members. Emotional well-being, the more distress in the system, the more it feeds into the pain and vice versa. The more pain, the more distress. And so how do we try to manage that arousal in the system? Believe it or not, something as simple as taking a deep breath in through your nostrils to the count of four, exhaling through your lips to the count of six, doing that for five, six, seven, eight times can really decrease the arousal in the system. That technique works very, very well if it's well rehearsed before we find ourselves in a critical situation or a crisis situation. There was a commercial on the radio some years ago. It just came on and basically said, in the next few moments, I'm just gonna teach you how to do a deep, relaxing breath. And on the radio, they would encourage people to take a deep breath. It makes a huge difference. Practice makes perfect, though. And then level of support. I know sometimes when our family members are hurting and when they're irritable and when they're crabby and when they're taking their hurt out on us, we wanna throw up our hands and walk out of the room. But it's important to say, this isn't about me right now. How can I lend support? How can I be here for my family member? These are some research articles that have been written about different aspects of chronic pain and how different variables can be important. Self-efficacy. This is the belief that it, something will work. If I believe that diaphragmatic breathing, that a relaxation exercise, that self-hypnosis will work, it's more likely to work for us. Once again, these techniques have to be rehearsed before they're used. Um, previous pain management uh, experiences, uh, level of support from family members makes a huge difference. Uh, personality, so introverts, extro extroverts, uh, where you find, fall along the continuum, and it's very specific to the individual. So for instance, an introvert may need time by himself or herself to manage a distressing situation. An extrovert may want to be with others to manage. So what we're talking about here are their personality characteristics that paired with the right intervention, the patient will do much better, the client will do much better. And then relationship with medical providers, and really that's the hallmark of this talk. How do we take this information back to our providers and say, you know what, it, it sounds like these medications are working, but can we also do some acupuncture? <laughs> or um, Because believe it or not, acupuncture is um, uh, well studied and can be very, um, very beneficial in managing pain, even as it relates to hemophilia. Pain is complex. I want to leave you with this message. There are a number of different variables that feed into the pain experience. The pain experience is the sum total of these and many other variables. So one of the reasons I do not like the question on a scale of 0 to 10, 10 being the worst, how would you rate your pain? Because that number reflects not only the pain sensation, but all these other things, right? It doesn't just reflect a pain sensation, it reflects the pain sensation as it relates to attention concentration, the quality of your sleep, the amount of muscle tension, a number of different other factors. Managing chronic pain, uh, we use a lot of what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, have you heard the term CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy? So CBT is really uh, looking at pain as it relates to our thoughts, our emotions, and our behaviors. Pain is in the middle of this triangle. So pain impacts the way we think, the way we think impacts the pain. Pain impacts our behaviors, and physical therapy does a <coughs> fabulous job of identifying how pain has impacted the way that we're carrying ourselves, the way we go from sit to stand, the way we walk, but also how that, those behaviors impact pain. Pain impacts our emotional well-being and vice versa, and these are some of the interventions. Education is huge. Sometimes just four sessions, I do four sessions a month that they repeat every month, just to talk about chronic pain what it means, how it affects us, what we can do about it. Sometimes just those educational handouts are sufficient for people to start doing things a little bit differently. Cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. People who engaged in CBT had less pain during treatment and pain resolution one year later. So these interventions work. This is one of my favorite findings. In terms of CBT managing arousal, we did talk about how arousal can exacerbate the pain experience. People who meditated experienced 40% decrease in pain intensity. What's phenomenal about this research is did you know that successful pain management using opioids is 40%? 40 to 50% pain relief is considered success with opioids. I'm not saying one or the other, but we can probably help those opioids along by using some meditative relaxation self-hypnosis techniques. And quite honestly, these days, you can go to YouTube 
type in self-hypnosis for pain, meditation for pain, um, progressive relaxation for pain or sleep, and you can find some fabulous examples of relaxation techniques that you can get in the habit of practicing once a day. It can be anywhere from five minutes to eight hours. There's a self-hypnosis for sleep that's eight hours long. That would drive me crazy, but, but some people do listen to these things all night long to sleep better. Putting pain in perspective, there's something to be said of writing or drawing uh, your pain story, sharing your thoughts, um, and then pacing, moderating is huge, but I know Kim is going to talk much more about that. There are complementary therapies, self-hypnosis, and there's some uh, research specifically with hemophilia. The terms that you hear a lot these days is muscle relaxation, meditative breathing, guided imagery. Quite honestly, in other cultures, these things have been around for centuries. In our culture, since the 1940s, progressive muscle relaxation has been around. It's being used more and more in an effort to help decrease or let go of unnecessary muscle tension so at the very least we can sleep better and it does a wonderful job in decreasing the, that pain level. Acupuncture, music therapy. Once again, I do want to say that even though today's session focuses more on the psychological and the physical, pharmacological agents are still being used. Our doctors, our nurse practitioners, our uh, medical providers can talk more about those interventions. However, I tell people that there's three ovals for a reason. If we become over-reliant on any one oval, that oval is gonna fail us. So try to have a mix of techniques that, that you're using. Okay, so I'm gonna start with managing acute pain. Um, the most important thing to understand here is what the goal is with acute pain. So you have acute and then you have chronic and then acute on chronic. With acute pain, the goal is to manage those physical experiences of pain to allow for rest and healing. So if we have an acute bleed, something new going on, we need to allow that to rest. We need to allow healing. If we're talking about a child, it's easier to maybe have them off school, you know, force the rest on them, do those things. If we're talking about an adult, so about half of the people in here, you can't just take work off, right? You can't just, oh, sorry, I have a bleed, I'm not gonna be in for a week. So the, what are the things that we can do to help manage that pain, allow the healing in that specific joint, but also keep you doing the activities that you need to do, okay? This acute pain most commonly is due to joint or muscle bleeding. We also experience a lot of acute pain related to surgeries, and that's another area that I see a lot of our bleeding disorders patients is post-surgical. One of the things you want to do is ask to see either the HTC, your hemophilia treatment center physical therapist, or ask for a referral to a physical therapist in the community if you don't have an HTC uh, physical therapist. Or if you live far from the treatment center, one thing I spend quite a bit of time doing too is, is making phone calls and educating the PTs at outside clinics who aren't familiar with bleeding disorders. Um, and you should feel confident yourself doing that education piece. When you're walking into a PT clinic, someplace that's not affiliated with the hemophilia treatment center, I guarantee you will know more about hemophilia than that physical therapist will. They are good at the physical therapy component of it, but you need to work as a team where you're educating about, here's what, you know, here's my experience of having an acute bleed, or I tried those things that you talked about and it actually made it worse. So really communicating and pulling in your HTC team to help educate. Um, we'll go over rest, ice, compress, elevate. I know you've heard it a million times, but there are some hopefully new little things I'll say today about it and why that is still important. And then exercise modalities, assistive devices, all the things that PT can do to help you in an acute situation. Again, making sure that you're communicating with your HTC team about time off that might be needed from work or school, how long that should be, and how quickly you can get back if that's what needs to happen. Okay, so rest. Why is rest important? What is the goal of rest? We're trying to limit the movement or the activity of that joint or of that muscle, depending on what's bleeding. We're trying to protect the joint, and ideally, we're trying to give some pain relief, right? So these are the braces, the splints, the immobilizers, wheelchair for some kids, crutches, canes, the little half scooters, meal scooters, there's all kinds of different things out there. Again, what we're looking for is what is gonna address the individual's needs. There is not one perfect answer for everybody. This is where you really wanna have your PT addressing your individual needs. Movement, I just wanna put this little caveat in there. Movement is important when you have soft tissue involvement, but it needs to be in a pain-free range. So when you have involvement of a muscle, the tendons, the ligaments, they need a little movement to know how to heal. Okay, they, there's fibers going together, you've torn them apart, they need to align the correct way to heal and they need to know where they're going. So there is movement um, involved in that. Again, that's why you need your PT involved. Okay, so bear with me, this is my little soapbox about why rest. So years ago, 
We took everybody with an acute bleed and we popped them in the hospital for three weeks and they didn't move. Then the pendulum swung all the way the other way because we got this great factor and we get it in right away and people think, caught it early, got the factor in, right back to activity. Kids are going back to sports really quickly. Uh, adults are going back and walking at work. Why is it important that we stay off of it? If you had an abrasion on your skin and you could see it, you could see that it was still kind of a scab or it was just starting to form a scab, would you rub that off day after day? No, hopefully not. You wouldn't look at that and think, oh, I think I'm gonna rub it and see if you know, kind of start the process over. Now you think about bleed, a bleed going on inside of your joint. Every time you move and you rub those joint surfaces together, it's similar to rubbing off that abrasion. Okay, your joint is trying to heal, it's trying to clear out the blood in there, and then you just rub and you start it all over again. Okay, that's one of the reasons that rest is important. There have been a lot of studies, um, a lot of them done on dogs with hemophilia, where they in induce a bleed in the knee and then force them to walk on a treadmill. And then other ones, they have a knee bleed and they get to rest, they have forced rest. After just one bleed with forced weight bearing, there's um, signs of significantly more joint damage than the dogs that were allowed to rest. So there are studies behind this. Um, similar uh, joint damage is not seen in those joints that are allowed to rest, so the dogs that were resting. Okay, so it's very important. The damage to cartilage from loading a joint during a new bleeding episode suggests that non-weight bearing should be used for bleeding episodes. This is for the hips, the knees, the ankles, anything lower extremity, right? If you're having an arm bleed, you can walk. If you're having a lower extremity bleed and you're not supposed to weight bear it on it, what if you also have an elbow issue? Does anybody have trouble with that? We don't have trouble with that, but I often hear um, favoring, like my leg, made, made my right leg made my left leg hurt, sure. or using crutches for my knee made my elbow or my shoulder hurt. Exactly. Yes, and, and we see that a lot. Or so you told me I'm not supposed to put any weight on my, on my ankle while it's bleeding, and so I went on crutches and now I have a bleed in my left elbow, right, because of the weight bearing through the crutches. That's why it's important to get your PT involved right away because the questions we're going to ask are not only about the joint that's bleeding, but what other issues have you had? Uh, do you have any elbow issues? Do you have shoulder issues? Okay, so it's a different assistive device that we're going to use, different things that we're going to do in order to treat that. Ice. Again, the goal is pain relief. The most important part with rest, ice, compress, elevate, and, and ice being uh, the one that I see most often, communicate with your treatment team. Does ice work for everyone for pain relief? <coughs> no. If our goal is to decrease pain, and I'm telling you to put ice on it and it makes it worse, it's not working, and just because I said to do that doesn't mean that you should do it. It means you should be calling me and saying, okay, you told me to try an ice massage, you told me to try whatever, it's making it worse. So that's not serving the purpose that we're trying to reach here, okay? Lots of different ways to apply ice. This, again, your physical therapist can help with that. Um, you know, the ice bath is one thing that I like to highlight that uh, for hands and feet, uh, fully submerging in the water is a great way to ice. Wrapping an ice pack around an ankle, you just can't get into all the little crevices and get everything well, so an ice bath works very well. Compression, goal again, pain relief. When you stand up, when you have a bleed and all of the blood rushes to that area, it increases the pain, right? The throbbing, the, the pressure, the tension from blood in that area. If you give the tissues a little support, give a little press back on it, you don't have as much of that swelling. If you can get that compression on there before it's allowed to fill in all of the tissues, you're gonna have even more pain relief from that. Again, you're discontinuing this if it increases the pain. Some people, just the process of applying the compression increases their pain. If you're trying to do like a tuba grip type um, compression wrap, just trying to slide that on is too much. Maybe the first day, maybe you can try it again the second day. Lots of different ways to do this. They're listed there. Again, the water submersion. Another reason that I like that, you get the hydrostatic pressure, pressure of water. So you're getting compression along with the icing when you do that. Elevation, again, the goal is decreasing pain, decreasing that throbbing. Reinforcing rest is one of the main reasons that we elevate in kids. You have to lay down, you have to get the joint above the heart. You can't be running around and elevating at the same time. So it's helping us reinforce that rest. One thing that I have found sometimes is people will elevate, let's say it's the ankle, so you elevate up really high on pillows, just under the ankle, and what's gonna happen? The, the pressure on the knee, exactly. The knee is gonna be just dying because it's going into hyperextension, so now your quad is firing, your hip flexors are firing, everything is all contracted trying to support this leg that you've got hanging up there, right? You actually made it worse, you made everything contract. So making sure that if you're elevating, you're supporting underneath the entire limb, so that you can actually let go of all that muscle tension and relax. Other things that the physical therapist can do. We all kinds of modalities. 
cold, heat, tens, biofeedback, all the different bracing that we can do, the different assistive devices. If you look at this little thing on the side, has anybody ever used one of those? The rollabout on the right there? So for an ankle bleed. So if somebody comes in, they've got an ankle bleed, or maybe they're post-surgical, they need to be off of the ankle, they've got upper extremity involvement. This thing is great. You kneel on it with one knee and scoot around. So now your arms aren't having to support your body weight, right? And you can still be off of that ankle. Those are the types of things, you know, all, all kinds of different assistive devices that we can use. <coughs> Positioning for comfort at work and school. You need to go back to work. Let's say you can take a day or two off, you need to go back. The knee bleed still isn't better. You work someplace where you need to stand. Okay, what are some of the things that we can do? Is there an assistive device that you can use? Do we need to write a letter that you can go back to work, but you need to be, you know, maybe doing a, a lighter duty? I had a kid in this week who worked stocking shelves at Target, and he had a lower extremity bleed. He can't use crutches while he's doing that, but he could cashier and sit on a high stool if he had a note from the treatment center saying he has to be off of his feet. So he can still work. He was concerned about losing the financial quote piece of it. He was concerned about it affecting his job. So we worked with him. Ideally, he would have been at home, but he couldn't do that. So what kind of things can we do to get you back to the activities, the things that you need to do? Spending time with your family, whatever that might be. Exercise. If something's going on with the knee, do we want the rest of the body to do nothing? No. So now not only is the knee having to go through rehab and strengthen, now we didn't do anything with the rest of the body while we were resting. So it's important to continue to exercise, stretch, strengthen other areas of the body. And we can help teach you how to do that without aggravating the area that's having issues. Endorphins are another thing that's great about exercise. So endorphins are chemicals that have a chemical structure similar to morphine. There are chemicals released in the brain, um, things such as exercise, sometimes spicy food, um, even pain will cause the body to release these endorphins. So we talk about cultivating endorphins. What can you do to get more endorphins? Exercise is one of the things that you can do. So continue to be up and moving. This doesn't mean you're out playing soccer while you're having a cute play, but you're moving. You're not just laying there letting everything um, get tense. Okay. Moving on to chronic pain. So this is often due from that hemophilic arthropathy, right? Damage to the joint from hemophilia. The arthritis, um, the breakdown of the cartilage, the bone cysts, the bone spurs, the, you know, all of that junk that happens because blood isn't supposed to be in a joint, right? Blood is foreign, the process of breaking it down, you get arthropathy. So we see a lot of chronic hemophilic arthropathy. How do we manage that pain? How do we get people to continue to do their activities? As Georgia said earlier, the goal can't be no pain. I think for everybody to come into that knowing if they have a chronic pain situation and to come into physical therapy and hope that we can bring them back to a zero pain is probably not realistic. Can we bring them down to a more manageable level of pain where you can do what you want to do during the day? There are things that are within your control. So teaching that, that management of it, that control of it, so it's not that you're sitting back and the pain is affecting you, but you're controlling it. You're in charge now. I can get it down to a two so that I can do what I want to do today. That word spontaneous, back at the beginning where I had that highlighted. What we found in the HERO study that I thought was interesting was the first time that a study specifically used the terminology repetitive activity. So it was asking a question about what do you attribute your most recent lead to? Um, and repetitive activity was one of the options. Previously, I, I feel that all of those bleeds, so this 34%, landed underneath that term spontaneous. Now to me, spontaneous means out of my control, right? It has that terminology to it, that feeling to it, that it was spontaneous, there was nothing I could do. It just happened, it just bled, and it's gonna happen again, and I can't do anything. Now you look at those as repetitive activity. There's no trauma, there wasn't a blow to the knee, there wasn't a fall, there's no trauma, but there was walking. Maybe there was typing, right? Maybe somebody does some sort of hammering for work. Repetitive activity. Not an injury, not a trauma, but still acts as trauma to the joint. Walking, just walking around can be trauma to the joint. What this tells us though, and I think was great about this HERO study, is it puts that control back with the person. If it's repetitive activity, then you come into your physical therapist and every time I am on the computer for more than an hour, my elbow flares up, right? Now that's repetitive activity. Did you do anything? Did you bump it on anything? No. It's that repetitive activity. I actually had a guy recently who this was the issue. Every time he was on his keyboard, his elbow flared up. We figured out he didn't have enough pronation, which is that motion where you uh, rotate your palm down. So we got him one of those ergonomic keyboards. It's tipped up, it kind of stands up like this. 
So you're in more of a neutral position for your pronation supination, took care of that pain that he was having. Does he still have underlying elbow issues? Absolutely. Does he probably have a baseline level of two out of 10? Sure, but can he work now for a couple hours without having that flare up to an eight? Yes, now he can. That was that repetitive activity that we can have an, an impact on. Again, for managing chronic pain, similar to acute pain, ask to see the PT. They can look at the bigger picture and help you kind of work through what are the things um, that are potentially an issue. Targeted stretching, range of motion, strengthening, TENS. I don't know if anybody's ever used a TENS unit for controlling pain. Um, it, it sends a signal that locks the pain signal back to the brain. Hydrotherapy, you know, all the different bracing that I talked about before. Sleep, um, different positioning for sleep. Sleep is a huge issue. As we talked about, it was found in the study. One thing, if you, if you bring nothing else out of today's session, remember this. <laughs> no hospital corners, ever. If your mom taught you to tuck in, you know, the hospital corners on the bed, rip them out. The whole bottom of the bed, so not just the corners, no sheets, no blankets, nothing should be tucked underneath, okay? Because you think about, if you have any sort of knee involvement, hip involvement, ankle involvement, and the bottom of the bed, the sheets and the blankets, everything is tucked in, and they do have some weight to them. And now you're asleep, and so your muscles are relaxed, so they're not supporting your joint. And then you roll over, and you're not awake and thinking, I'm rolling over, I should be careful about my knee. Now you're fighting against that tucked in blanket and sheet. So you're twisting, you're causing trauma to the joint, you're irritating it. The other thing is, for the back sleepers out there, when you're on your back, your foot goes into a pointed or a plantar flex position. When you're asleep and your muscles relax, it goes even further into a plantar flex position. Anybody with ankle issues will attest to this, that putting that ankle in that plantar flex position and adding the weight of the blankets all night long, you get up in the morning, something's not right. It's locked, it has relaxed, you've gotten stuck in that position, okay? Untuck the sheets, stick the feet out. If you have cold feet, put some slippers on, <laughs> but untuck those sheets. Addressing structural muscular issues. If you have you know, anterior tightness, you see those muscle, the, the big weightlifter guys, and it's all here, right? If you ask them to try and do something with their back muscles, they probably can't even stand up straight because it's all that anterior. Those of us that aren't big weightlifters also have that issue though. Everything is forward, right? We're not doing anything behind us, so we're forward all day long. So we're using all of these muscle, muscles. We get very short and tight in the front, very long and weak in the back, which affects our posture, okay? It affects the tension in our neck. So if we can do some muscle balance, doing some strengthening to those muscles in the back, so now you're not in always this forward type position, but you're more in a neutral position. And PT, it reduces pain, improves function. Hopefully that is the plan. Regular exercise, um, great for managing chronic pain. One thing that I think is really important about exercise, and this doesn't have to be anything more than walking or some sort of activity. Again, it puts some control back with you. When you feel stronger, when you feel healthier, when, you, when your breathing is easier, you just you feel better overall, okay? 150 minutes of moderate intensity a week. That sounds like a huge number when you first look at it. So break it down into, that's 30 minutes, five days a week, and you can break it down into 10 minute chunks and it's just as beneficial as the 30 minutes all at a time. So that means you could park further away if you're going to work in the morning, going to the grocery store, wherever you're going, kids school, Park further away and spend 10 minutes walking there. That's one of your 10 minutes during the day. Go for a 10 minute walk over lunch. And then maybe, you know, biking, something at night, up and down the stairs, something that you can do. Little 10 minute blocks of time, break it down into, into manageable pieces, okay? Stretching is great, should be incorporated every single day. Don't do real intense stretching um, before you're gonna get on a treadmill, do any type of activity like that because it actually stimulates a relaxation response. So you don't want those muscles all stretched out before you're wanting to use them. So do your intense stretching after activity, or you can do that first thing in the morning because you do get that relaxation response and makes managing the day better. Weight control uh, is another way to manage chronic pain. Every one pound loss reduces the stress at the knee by four pounds. Don't forget rice, rest, ice, compress, elevate. Important for chronic pain, just as important as it is for, for acute pain. And then some of those relaxation cues. Georgia had a great tip. Um, that she would, has told people to, every time there's um, you know, some cue that you have in your life, so I think you used the example of walking through a door frame. So every time you walk through a door frame, think of one of your, one of your relaxation cues. Okay, so one of them is tongue up, teeth apart, jaw relaxed. We carry a ton of tension right up here, right? All night long, all day long, people do that. If you put your tongue up just behind your top teeth, that'll make your teeth come apart a little bit and, and instantly relax your jaw. You can't do that all day long or remember it all day long. So the cue that Georgia had, every time you walk through a door frame, that's a little cue to you, oh yeah, 
Where is my mouth in all of this, right? Where is my jaw? How tense am I? Another one is the head up, chin in, shoulders down and back. Especially nowadays with these fabulous things. Everybody is here. Our weight, our head has a lot of weight to it, right? So if your head is down and not up, you're hanging a bowling ball and all of these muscles are having to support that, okay? If your chin is not in, if your chin's out here, again, all of these muscles are having to support your big bowling ball head. So if you keep your head up, so either walk around like this or put it down when you're walking, is what I would prefer. <laughs> put your head up, tuck your chin in. Think about taking your shoulder blades and tucking them into your back pockets. That shoulder's back and down, okay? And then diaphragmatic breathing, which I am not going to teach today. Um, Georgia touched on it. Ideally, um, it's like a 10, 15 minute session I would spend with you really, really working on how to do diaphragmatic breathing. So something to bring back and communicate with your treatment center about if you're interested. Make sure if you're considering a surgery, an injection, anything like that, communicate with your treatment team about what your realistic expectations are. So you need to go in, here's what I'm hoping to get from this. Is that actually realistic? But I just wanted to summarize for today that when you go back to your HTCs or your medical providers, one of the things that you want to aim for is working with the entire team. If they have a social worker, if they have a physical therapist, if they have a nurse on staff, uh, these individuals are very familiar with everything that we talked about today. And if they're not, you can share this material with them. Uh, so work with the entire team. Try to address pain from multiple pathways. It's okay to talk about um, my, my joint is hurting, but it's also uh, important to talk about, you know what, when this hurts, I find myself putting more pressure on other joints in my body. And so look at the big picture. Help your medical team look at the bigger picture. Try new options, share ideas. One of the things I love about the regional conferences, the local um, meetings, is that you guys can talk to one another. What works from one family may work for another family. Collect data about your pain level, your pain intensity, what makes it better or worse, and take that information back to the healthcare providers. It's not uncommon for patients to come in and say, Georgia, I'm okay all day. At the end of the day, when I'm trying to sleep, my pain is at its worst. You know what I usually tell them? You've been ignoring the pain all day long, <laughs> and you've been overdoing it, and now you're having difficulty sleeping because there's no other distraction that you can use at bedtime. So listen to your body sooner rather than letting that pain flare uh, grasp your attention. Before we get to a pain flare, we usually have muscle tension in the body. Before we have muscle tension in the body, we typically have fatigue. If you push through the fatigue, if you ignore the muscle tension, you're going to end up in a flare and it's going to be hard for you to fall asleep and we all know what happens when we're not sleeping well. In fact, the literature suggests that if we take two healthy individuals and put them in a sleep lab, one person will let them sleep like they typically do, the next person will wake up every 20 minutes, much like what happens when we have chronic pain. Uh, that person, over two week period of time, having been awakened every 20 minutes during their sleep, will develop aches and pains in their body. So we know if we already have chronic pain and we're not sleeping well, it makes the pain worse. Have a plan. Have a plan for acute pain, chronic pain, and that plan may be different for home, for school, for work, um, and you might want to carry some things with you. Improving communication with friends, family, and coworkers. This is not something that was the focus of our topic, but NHF has some uh, good information about sharing uh, what you know with others and then asking for support. Interestingly, once again, the literature suggests that everybody knows when we're in pain. How do you think they know that? What do you think they clue into? If I'm hurting, how would my husband not know that? He'd be grumpy, probably. Grumpy? <laughs> I may be more likely to withdraw. I may be holding an affected area, whether it's a joint or whatnot. Typically what happens is family members, friends know that you're hurting. They respond to your pain in one of three ways. One response pattern is what's referred to as a punishing response. They might roll their eyes and walk out. This is more likely to happen in a workplace or a school setting because they have no idea what pain may mean for you or your body. But that punishing response does not help any. The other set of responses is what's called helpful responses, and we use this term in quotations because sometimes too much help can make the pain worse. How? 
if a family member does everything for us when we're hurting, what happens? You don't want to do anything yourself. You may not want to do anything yourself. Typically, what family, family members or uh, patients tell me is, Georgia, I just don't feel like I'm contributing anymore, and people want to be able to do for themselves. So we have to find a balance. Once again, this is different between acute pain and chronic pain. We may need to do more in acute pain settings, but when it's chronic pain, we want to be able to do with. And that's the category of responses that works the best. It's what's called distracting responses, but I'm not suggesting distracting using jokes or whatnot. Distracting is a combination of, I know you're having a rough time. What do we need to do to get through it and working as a team? So distracting responses and then uh, provide support. What can we do uh, in return? So the next few slides have to do for, uh, with advocating for pain management. You may not have pain management services at your HTC. You can inquire. You don't necessarily have to go to a pain management center or clinic. They, your providers, existing providers might say, you know what, let me contact the pain management providers, see what they might do differently or what they might recommend, and we'll work as a larger team to get the, this pain better managed. Resources, these days on the internet, you can find just about anything. And so these are just a few of the resources, pain diaries, uh, uh, flare information, pain clinics, what they are, how do we get to them. And like I said, you don't necessarily have to go to a pain clinic. And keep in mind that all pain clinics are different. Some are all about managing meds. Some are all about injections. Some are more comprehensive and interdisciplinary. And they offer acupuncture and yoga and um, lots of self-care instruction. And those are the typical ones that I refer to or work with. And these are some examples of pain diaries. You wouldn't do this every day for the rest of your life, but you might take a week's work and take it into your doctor and say, you know, this is what I've been noticing. This is what I've been struggling with. And those are, there are apps for that as well. This is a, some information of what we have learned about pain management over the years. Very complex, best treated in an interdisciplinary team, meaning working with all members of the team and all members of your family. So the HTC is designed to be that interdisciplinary team. Finding an HTC near you if you're not uh, currently involved in one, or the other way that the CDC site is really helpful is if you're going on vacation someplace, looking ahead of time, what is the closest HTC? It's better to be prepared. Chances are you won't need it then, but if you don't know where it is, that's when something's gonna happen and then you're gonna spend a bunch of time and lose valuable time trying to find the treatment center. So this is on the CDC website. <laughs>